Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Speaking of uh, messes that may or may not be unfixable, um, you, you may remember, obviously if you're still clinging to the carcass of the idea that Brexit was a good idea, you'll be desperately pretending that fish were never mentioned and fishermen were never mentioned as, as one of the only areas of British life that could expect an improvement to their terms and conditions to their existences as a result of leaving the single market and the customs union. They have been comprehensively shafted, but again, it is to be hoped that these problems can be fixed. It may already be too late for, for some. Um, uh, the, the BBC once again uh, cowed as it is and uh, denying observable reality, describing an overnight ban by the EU, having left some Cornish fisher folk facing penury and bankruptcy, um, which would make you very cross, wouldn't it, with the EU, if it was true. Here is the Secretary of State for the Environment, George Eustace, talking to Cathy Newman on Channel 4 News recently. And then I'm going to share with you a document that I have stumbled across as a result of hours of research, found it on Twitter, uh, which... But well, it'd just be an interesting comparison to make, and then we'll speak to someone who really knows his onions, or rather, oysters. Generally, it was teething problems, but what we are left with at the end of it, and I don't deny this, is that because we've left the customs union and because we've left the single market, we had to do that if we wanted to regain control of our own laws. And that does mean that there are some additional administrative processes that the EU requires, and obviously there is a, there is a cost to that, and I, I accept that... Some businesses would rather not have that cost, but it is the price, if you like, of, of having democracy and self-government. Well, teething problems is how you've described it, but some businesses, like the shellfish exporters, for example, are facing ruin. Well, um, generally speaking, as I said, it's been teething problems in terms of people's readiness to use the export health certificates and familiarise themselves with that. We have had a specific issue on bivalve mollusks, that is, mussels and uh, cockles and oysters in particular, where these uh, have been built on a model of going to restaurants uh, in places like France and being purified whilst on site. The EU had said originally that that trade could continue. Uh, their own laws provide for it to continue and actually refer to a certificate that would enable it to continue. But they have had a change of heart, a policy change. Uh, and although there's no legal impediment to this trade, the European Union uh, told us a couple of weeks ago that they weren't going to allow it to continue. Well, actually, so we're working with them on that. To, to be clear, they haven't had a change of heart. Uh, they've said quite specifically the rules in this area have not changed. They have applied and continue to do so to all third countries. This is not new and it is not a surprise to the UK administration. You should have known about it all along. Now, this is a trade that they don't do with any other third country. And it is uh, somewhere where they've changed their position. Uh, we had That's dialogue not what they say. With... Either they're right... No, they're not right. Right, they're, no, they're, they're wrong. Not right. I, I, they are wrong. We do know what they say. We're very familiar with this body of law. We lived with it for 50 years, and we've got technical experts in this area. We had actually discussed it with the Commission, uh, and the Commission had told us the trade could continue. Are they, they just making it up, the, then? Yes, they told us the type of export health certificate that could be used, uh, and their own uh, both public health and animal health laws do provide for the trade to continue. Uh, what happened is that the um, Commission decided, and this was a late decision, uh, that they only uh, took on the first week of February, that they were actually going to change their mind and not allow that trade to continue after all. So what are you going to do about it? Well, we're di in a dialogue with them because it's an indefensible decision. There's no public health or even animal health grounds for these sorts of restrictions. So we, uh, we're obviously trying to persuade them to change that. Uh, if they don't, then we will support the industry to invest in our own depuration equipment in this country so that the trade can continue. But a lot of exporters won't have time for that. They will go bust in the meantime. Can you guarantee that the government won't let a single shellfish exporter go bust because of Brexit? Well, what I can say is that uh, yesterday we announced a new scheme to help those shellfish businesses that have been affected by this extraordinary EU decision to help them with their fixed costs while we find a solution. So, but Trade can you guarantee continue. that you're not going to let a single one of these businesses go bust because of the decision that you took to leave the EU? Well, of course, I can't guarantee um, what will happen to individual businesses. What I can guarantee is that the government is there to support them. And this week we've opened a fund that they are eligible to apply to to help cover their fixed costs. George Eustace, thanks very much. Thank you.
Okay, so you heard that, right? There was a categorical claim that the EU had changed its position, that they were either lying or, or misleading. You, remember, that, that, that's the point. Or, or the British government, represented there by George Eustace, the Secretary of State for Environment, claiming that they'd done it. Was it the first week of February, first week of January? You heard that, right? I, I wasn't dreaming. So this is something published by the government in March of 2019. This is a, a British government document. You can find it yourself. Uh, it's entitled Exporting or Moving Live Fish and Shellfish. This is, I think it's from March of 2019. The EU Commission has indicated that undepurated LBMs, that's live bivalve mollusks, from Class B waters cannot be imported from Great Britain into the EU for the purpose of depuration, which is a fancy word for purification. This affects both wild harvested live bivalve mollusks and those from aquaculture. Um, the FHI, I don't know what that stands for, but my next guest will tell us, are unable to certify for these confinement, consignments until this situation is, in, is resolved. DEFRA, which is the department of which George Eustace is now the Secretary of State, I think, is continuing to look for a solution to allow exports of wild harvest live bivalve mollusks to the EU to resume. So we clip it right down just to the bit where he claims the EU is lying. Just, just that 20-30 that second window because I want to get to the bottom of this. Someone's not being straight with us. It's either the British government or it's the British government. Because this document was published by the British government. George Eustace is the Secretary of State for the Environment and the Department for uh, the Environment, Farming and Rural Affairs has published in black and white, it's in front of me now, a statement which categorically describes the impossibility of transporting unpurified live bivalve mollusks from Great Britain to the EU. And I, I, I know you're probably still pretending not to care and insisting that you knew what you were voting for, but at some point you're going to have to start objecting to being lied to, if that's what's happening here. And we'll move a little closer to knowing whether it is or not now, because Tom, I, Tom Howard is an eighth-generation oyster man, which is a, a wonderful, absolutely wonderful phrase, but it means that you really know what you're talking about when it comes to oysters. So two things, Tom, thank you for your time. We'll, we'll start with the question of whether any of your, your colleagues, whether any industries at your company, Richard Howard Oysters, based in West, West Mercy, are you, are you aware of any companies that have already gone to the wall because, because that was the warning? And then second, who do you think is telling us the truth here? The, the, the document that I've just read out or the Secretary of State for the Environment? Yeah, I mean, morning. Hello, um, man. Yeah, I mean, I know because um, we're part of the Shellfish Association of Great Britain, um, we're in contact with shellfish producers all around the UK, whether that's oysters, mussels, um, cockles. Um, and I do know of guys, particularly the mussel sector, that yes. have basically come to a halt, complete halt, because they harvest their mussels and then send them straight off into Europe unpurified because um, there's a big market for mussels in places like France and Belgium yeah. um, and those guys over there then handle them and process them and treat them to get them to the customer um, as fresh as possible. So those guys have been, I mean, they're talking a complete grind to a halt. And to, to, to be clear, while, while they talk, uh, they try to sell it as an overnight EU ban, it would be illegal for those guys to sell their moss mussels here unpurified in the UK. So it's not as if they can simply offload them on, on British fishmongers and supermarkets and hope that they... Yeah, exactly. That's just unbelievable. I, I, that's I mean, the first thing I contacted you about on Twitter because I read your mag magisterial tweet on the subject. There's a long thread of explanation and I just thought at the end of it, hang on a minute, these fellas can't even sell their mussels here because of our food standard laws. Well, exactly. I mean, and this is the thing. I mean, I mean people... There's, there seems to be a misconception that it's just you... you grab some oysters, you grab some mussels, throw them in a box and send them to a customer or something like that. But there's rigorous standards, and rightfully so that there are rigorous standards there that we have to abide by to make sure the food we eat um, is safe. And um, these mussel guys, there's, there's a couple of caveats there. One, not enough people in Britain eat shellfish. So these mussel guys are my oysters. Not enough British people are interested in them because for whatever reason it is. Um, so... It, it's basically shrunk the market and meant that we 
are limited on where we can put food. Yeah. And again, there's not enough depuration facilities in this country for for lots of people to be able to get their product out there. And, and, and it's not something we could build. I mean, again, whether or not enough businesses are still in place by the time the depuration plants have been built is, a, is, a, is, is moot. But you, you're of particular interest because you've got quite a big purification operation as part of your business already. Yeah. Yeah, we do both. I mean, and that's the thing is we... we I mean, I've been looking at... Um, this situation over the past three years and because I didn't trust from the very beginning that there would be a clear and um, and decent um, kind of conclusion yeah. to all this and I thought it's going to be chaos for the industry. I mean, I've actually been changing our business model for the past three years to make sure that we can deal with Europe basically not being a partner anymore and not being a customer anymore. What did I mean, you I see? Because at the time... And, 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 and like you, I don't want anybody to come away from this conversation thinking that the, 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 the companies that have been banjaxed by the, 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 the new trading arrangements, by us becoming a third country, only have themselves to blame for the situation that they're in. Because I know you are not in any stretch of the imagination saying that. But what no. did you see while well, the media conversation, the politics of it, was telling fishermen in particular that they were going to be the big winners of this process? Why did you see something that many of your colleagues and indeed competitors completely missed? Because it was lies. Ultimately, I saw through the lies. And... I think you judge a person very much by the content of their character. And to be honest, the people that were spouting these grand gestures that it's going to be this revolution for the fishing industry were not people that I would trust to look after my unborn child when it's born. You know, mm. I just wouldn't trust them at all. And I could see that it was just empty slogans. And that's ultimately it. It's empty slogans they were using for this adulation and for votes. And But there was no practical... Um, procedure behind it. There was nothing pragmatic about what they were saying because as as an industry, as me, as a very small part of a very big pond, um, excuse the pun, um, <laughs> you know, I I could even see the issues that were going to hit us hard and that's, and I thought, well, if these issues, if I can see these issues and I'm no, by no means an expert on trade and I'm no yeah. means an expert on the, the intricacies involved in, and getting a trade agreement, I saw the issues that were going to come ahead. So I thought, right, we've got to be prepared for this. And so for the past three years, I've been scaling back our trade with Europe and trying to increase our domestic market. But I'm lucky in the sense that I have depuration facilities to be able to do that. And Other people aren't so lucky. They were literally, if we don't have Europe, we've got nothing. And that's the problem. So, and it was never addressed. So when, and, and this document, you'll be more familiar than it with I am, mm. but it's pretty unequivocal. Uh, the EU Commission yeah. has indicated that undepurated de LBMs from Class B waters cannot be imported from Great Britain into the EU. Yeah. Now, I, I think I've dated that to March 2019. How yeah. do you process the Secretary of State this week saying this? We had actually discussed it with the Commission uh, and the Commission had told us the trade could continue. Are they, they just making it up, the, then? Yes, they told us the type of export health certificate that could be used, uh, and their own uh, both public health and animal health laws do provide for the trade to continue. Uh, what happened is that the um, Commission decided, and this was a late decision, uh, that they only uh, took on the first week of February, that they were actually going to change their mind and not allow that trade to continue after all. So he's saying that you've been wasting your time and money getting ready for a thing that was only only came into play on the, the beginning of February. Well, I, I'm just a bit flabbergasted by it, to be honest, yeah. because um, from what he's saying is that ultimately they were just saying to each other, oh, this will be OK, but nothing was written down. Yeah. So, you know, it's surely, surely if it's... I mean, they made it out that fishing was the massive, massive area of Brexit that was, it was almost like their campaign slogan. Surely they would have got every single minute detail sorted for that, as opposed to just saying, oh, it's, yeah, we, sp we spoke about it, it's going to be fine. I mean, that to me is nonsense. And I, I, and I let's be honest, I honestly believe that's a lie. So. Okay. Um <laughs> eighth, eighth generation. How many greats is that? What, what was your? Who, who set it up? Great, my great, 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 great grandfather. How many? Great grandfather. Fifth great grandfather. <laughs> great, 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 great granddad. Yeah. And you're going to be all I'm right. Still, 
I mean, we still walk across the same bit of mud that That's he walked incredible. across in the 1700s, picking up oysters. I, I, I mean, it's I, a wonderful. I, can I come and see you one day when all this is over? I'd love to have a look at what you do. Would that be all right? Take a boat trip. That would be absolute. I'm, I'm, I'm so late for the break, Tom. I'm so grateful to you for your time, and I'll, I'll, I'll retweet all the available information. But I just find that so magical. Um, I really do. And I'm so sorry for, for what your whole trade is going through. If only someone had, I mean, warned your colleagues and competitors, eh? There's still a couple of people out there. I presume these are now jokes, right? Saying, ha, 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 I love it, I love it, I love Brexit because it's upset James. You sort of, wait, we're talking about fishermen going bankrupt. You literally voted to make their lives better. And, and so, I, 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 look, either, either you are yanking my chain or you're in need of serious help. And, and I am not qualified to give it.